right. Good morning. Hey, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 21. That's where we're going to hang out for a couple minutes this morning. And as you turn there, um, I want to tell you guys a story um, that, that some of you may have heard because I shared it with, with, with a few of you um, I, actually a couple weeks before we moved into the new building. But it was on the day that like, we had that like, sewer backup leak. Does anybody remember that day? It was awful. It's, this place smelled terrible. And we ended up canceling three of our four services that day. But if you were happen to be here, you heard. Or if not, then let me share with you for the first time that at that point in time, Truett, um, my youngest, who was, who was four then and, and he's five now, had just started stepping into the Lego phase of, of, of boyhood, okay? And it has been awesome. Um, I love the Lego stage of life. I don't really know who gets more excited whenever we get a new Lego kit in our house. You know, Truett or, or me as we get together to put these things together. And we Lego together, friends, all the time. Any Lego fans out there? Yes? Fantastic. So one of the really fun things for me has actually been being able to show Truett some of the Lego things that I've collected over the years as well and letting him see those as well. But one of the really difficult things for him to process and understand is that when it comes to dad's Legos, okay, there are certain Legos that are for display, okay, and not actual play. Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about? I, I've literally become the mean dad in the Lego movie, if you've ever watched, uh, watched that. Um, and so there's certain things that I'll show him, but I don't necessarily want him playing with them, okay? And so one of the ones that that I showed him that, that I love, that I, that I didn't really want him messing with, was my Ghostbusters Ecto-1, okay? Anybody? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I'm, I'm a Ghostbusters nerd. I grew up loving Ghostbusters as a kid. And so this was one of the things that I couldn't wait to show Truett. Look what I made out of Legos, man. This is, this is amazing. And so um, as I showed it to them, though, of course, his number one question was what? Can I play with it, Dad? And again, true it, this is to look at, okay? This is to enjoy the aesthetic beauty. Um, it's not something we play with, but, but, you know, the more he pleaded and he kind of wore me down, I was like, okay, you know what, son? I will let you play with, with Ecto-1 for, for a little bit. You know, he wore me down. So I, uh, so I gave him the car, and then I go off and do my other thing. And about 15 minutes later, I'm on the other side of my house, and as, I don't remember what I was doing, but I'm on the other side of the house, and all of a sudden I hear crying. Um, I'm like, what, what, is, what is going on? Why, you know, what, what is the crying? So, so I started walking back across our house, and as I get closer to the kids' room, Truett's door was not all the way closed, but it, it, was, it was mostly closed. And as I walked up, I, I found out that the crying was coming from Truett's room. So, so I walk in, and I open the door, and no lie, friends, he was sitting on his knees like this with his head on the bed and his arms hanging down <laughs> right here. And like, he was just like sobbing into his, 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 his bed. And so I'm, I don't know what's going on. So I walk, and as I get a little bit closer, I see that on the other side of Truett was what used to be um, <laughs> Ecto-1. I, I didn't remember it had that many pieces to begin with. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure Egon was crying as well. Um, and if you got that reference, we should be friends, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so, so I go and, and, I, and, I, and I scoop up my, my little four-year-old guy in my arms. I'm like, true, you know, but, buddy, what's wrong? What happened? And then it just all, like, all the emotions just, like, flood out, right? I mean, he's like, Dad, I'm so sorry. You know, I was just playing with it on the bed. And, you know, I was playing with it up here. And then it, it fell off the bed. And then it broke. And then oh, and he's, he's crying, trying to catch his breath. And he's like, but then I tried to fix it, put it back together. But then I broke it more. Um, and, and I'm like, well, yes, you did, son. Um, uh, and, um, and, and, and I mean, he's just crying. He's just he's beside himself. He's like, Dad, I really tried to fix it. I know I'm so sorry. And his last words were, I ruined your favorite toy. <laughs> I don't know if men in their late 30s should have a favorite toy. <laughs> but regardless, true, it was like in that moment, like my, my son was seriously devastated. Like he was like weeping. And what, here's what's interesting. I mean, you learn so much as a parent and you, and you begin to raise your children. But the more that I started talking to him about what had happened, I realized that Truett, he wasn't crying because he was afraid he was going to be in trouble. Truett was crying because he was so upset that he had broken something that he knew that dad loved. And so what, what was going through his mind, you know, um, even, even as, as a young kid was, um, okay, does the breaking of the car mean the breaking of relationships? Now, this is probably what it sounded like more like in his, you know, in his kid mind. Will dad still love me after dad sees what I've done? And friends, even at four years old, my, my little guy was so upset by the uncertainty of that question that he couldn't bring himself to come and tell me what was going on. He couldn't bring himself to come find dad. So the only solution in his poor little four-year-old mind was to sit all alone in his room sad 
and surrounded by a mess that he had made. And here's what I want to talk about this morning. This is a little bit more of a, of a heavy topic, but friends, this is so often how people approach their relationship with God. Because even at the youngest of ages, I didn't have to teach true with this, okay? I didn't have to ingrain this. But even at the youngest of ages, we start living with this mentality that I have to earn love, okay? That in order for you to love me, I have to earn it. And so really, it's by my successes or my failures that, that you're going to accept me, that you're going to care for me, that you're going to love me, and then you're going to help me into this next phase of life. And so he didn't know what to do. Broken in his struggle, not really sure what dad was going to do because of something that he's done. Because again, this mentality, I have to earn it so that dad will love me. And when you try to live your faith, friends, and your approach to God, if we try to live your faith in that way, that leaves you with one of two options. This is a really hard way to do faith because if that is your mindset that I have to earn the love of God, especially when I, when, when I blow it, when I mess up, that leaves you with two options. One, never fail. Or two, when I mess up, I have to fix it to get right with the Lord. I have to earn my way back into his grace and his favor. But, he, but here's the problem. You read any portion of scripture, you realize that you, are, you and I, we are ill-equipped to do either. We can't make that happen in and of ourselves. But what it does is that it makes so many followers of Jesus, they push pause on, on their present relationship with the Lord because of the mistake they've made. Because in their rearview mirror, there was a decision there's an action, something said, or something done that brought a lot of brokenness. And I'm not really sure how to move forward with the mess around me because of something I've done in my path. And so we, we, we just pause things. And this is where, where believers start to ask these kind of questions. Okay, could God still love me because I fill in the blank? Or could God still use me because I fill in the blank? Or is there any possible way for God to fix the mess that I've made? And this was the question that Peter was asking, get this, after the resurrection. After the resurrection. Now, we're in a series, we're closing up today, called After Effect. We've been looking at some encounters with Jesus after the resurrection that, that impacted people's lives tremendously moving forward. But after the resurrection, Peter was really struggling with, can I still be loved? Can I still be used? Now, here's why. How many of you guys remember Peter? Let me see your hands. Everybody remember Peter? Um, uh, hopefully, you remember him a little bit better than Claudius, if you were here last week. Um, uh, if you don't get that reference, go back and watch the podcast. But, so Peter, here's the interesting thing. If you read three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and if that was your only exposure to, to Peter's life, um, then your picture of Peter was not a good one, okay? This guy uh, was somebody that kind of got dropped off, you know, uh, uh, in some not great circumstances because these were the earliest Gospels written. They were written earlier than John's. And as they were circulating, they end the story with Peter, okay? Basically, the last real details of any interaction was Peter standing around a, char a charcoal fire inside the gates of the high priest's court after Jesus has been arrested and while Jesus is being interrogated. And as he stands there waiting to see what's going to happen with Jesus is where he infamously, what, he, he denies Christ not once, not twice, but, but, but three times around that fire. And here's the interesting thing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, from that point forward, almost nothing is said about Peter. Now, he's mentioned, you know, in groups, like, you know, he was there when, the, when Jesus appeared to the, to, to the disciples afterwards. And so he was included in some things like that, but no more interaction like to his actual story. So if you were to just read those, and if you were like, you know, someone who was receiving these gospels in the early church and maybe had not heard all the stories, then your picture of Peter is, 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 is not a good one. He's the guy that abandoned Jesus. He's the guy that, that was the, the betrayer. And, and I don't think it was because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were, you know, they're not trying to cancel culture Jesus, okay? I mean, uh, cancel culture Peter and say, hey, you know, he's no good. He's, you know, he, you know, you know casting from our mind. Let's move on from Peter. But the fact is, those three gospels end with the resurrection. But we know, friends, that the resurrection was not the end of the story. 
So John, who writes his gospel 20, between 20 and 30 years after these other guys. Now, we talked about this last week when we looked at Thomas. Um, John ends in, in John chapter 20, kind of like the climax of his gospel, talking about Thomas. And then he talks about how all these things were recorded in, in this book, and there was so much more that could be said and done. And, and many commentators believe that he actually originally finished his gospel with that, but because he knew what was circulating um, in the gospel accounts so far, um, he decided that he was going to add kind of like an epilogue to his, to his gospel and include one final story that is not recorded in any of the other three gospels. And this story has everything to do with Peter because at the time that John wrote his gospel, it is likely that Peter had already now been martyred under Nero in Rome. So John takes this opportunity to help people bridge the gap from where he went from being Peter the betrayer to Peter the martyr and what happened in between. And here's the awesome thing, because in this one account found in John, not only is Peter going to get some good news in his situation, but, but friends, we are going to see some really, really good news for us. When you struggle or you fail or you mess up or you invite something in your life that causes all kinds of brokenness, because what Peter's going to see and what we're going to see is this. Friends, failure is not final. Failure is not final if we will fail forward. And what we're going to look at is how, what does that look like and how can we learn what it looks like to fail forward when we make those mistakes that we feel like separates from God? What can we learn from this account of Peter? And that's what we're going to look at in, in John chapter 21 this morning. So now, now really quickly, let me just make sure that you understand what's going on. So um, on Easter Sunday, some angels appear. You know, there were several angelic appearances. And one of those, they, they, they told um, uh, the women that were at the tomb to go take this message to the disciples that, hey, you guys need to head north to Galilee, and you're going to hang out there for a little bit, and Jesus is going to meet you there with further instructions, okay? That was one of the messages. Now, we know that the disciples stayed in Jerusalem after the, the resurrection for at least a week, um, because that's where Thomas um, saw him with all the others in, in the upper room, like we talked about last week. But some point after that initial Initial week, all the disciples they gather up and they move up north to Galilee to wait for further instructions from Jesus. Remember, he's having all these appearances after his resurrection. They're kind of sporadic. There's not necessarily time frames given, but they know they're supposed to go north and wait for him. So they do, and they head up to Galilee. And when they get there, it was kind of like the same thing with Thomas. They didn't know where they were going to see him again. They didn't know when he was going to show up. He didn't give any specific timeline. He was just go to Galilee, and Jesus will meet you there. So they go up to Galilee, you know, after a week, and, and they're hanging out there, and the scriptures don't tell us how long they were there. We don't know how many days that they've been waiting, but at one point, Peter, um, who was a fisherman by trade, decides, you know what, I'm going to go out on the boat tonight. And these, the fishermen back then, in this, this area of the world, they would, they would fish overnight, and this is when they would catch the majority uh, of their stuff. And so Peter decides, I'm going to go ahead and go out on the boat, because it's better than just sitting around and waiting, because nothing is happening right now. Anyway, we don't know what's going on. And truthfully, Peter, friends, needed a distraction. Peter needed a distraction from his thoughts because here's the deal. Peter was just as excited as everybody else when he saw the resurrected Jesus. Peter was just as excited about the fact that Jesus was alive. But also, at the same time, Peter could not stop thinking about the fact that just a little over a week earlier, I disowned Jesus. I cut off all allegiance publicly, and all the other guys know it. Jesus has said this was going to happen. Everybody else knows what's going to happen. And in the occurrences that Jesus has resurrected um, and appeared so far, they have not had the conversation about that moment yet. They have not talked about that moment. And so as excited as he was, he cannot stop thinking about it. Because what does it mean now? When Jesus finally shows up in Galilee, what's going to happen? Is he going to dismiss me at that point? Is Jesus going to punish me because of the mistakes that I had made there? Or maybe I'm just going to be forever be known as, as the terrible disciple. The guy that betrayed Jesus in such an awful way. And I can't imagine. Can you imagine the angst that Peter must have felt like for the appearances where he had see, seen Jesus? Like part of him he just wants to go and embrace and hug, hug Jesus' neck, but at the same time he can't even look him in the eyes. And this tension between these two feelings had just become like, like unbearable for Peter. So he goes and he gets in the boat with some of the other guys and they start fishing overnight. And as they do, uh, they don't catch anything in the early hours of the next morning. Okay, this is where we're about to pick up the story. Okay, so in the early hours of the next morning, they're sitting out on the boat. Haven't caught anything. Um, it's, it's, it's close to sunrise. The sun's about to come up. And then suddenly somebody from the shore starts yelling out to the boat. And they start yelling out for, 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 for Peter uh, to, to throw the net to the other side of the uh, of the boat. Now, Peter's an expert fisherman. Maybe he rolled his eyes, you know, who is this stranger, you know, telling us to do something on this? But, but he does it. And he throws it over. And as soon as that net hits the water on the other side, um, Peter has a deja vu moment. Because all of a sudden, the, the net starts filling up 
with fish. We're not talking like one or two fish. We're talking like overflowing with fish, like pulling down the weight of the boat. Um, and immediately, this would have connected Peter to one other moment, three years earlier. And it was the moment where Jesus had called him to be one of his followers. Jesus was in the boat, and the exact same thing had happened. Jesus in the boat said, cast it to the other side after a night of catching no fish. He did, and the same miracle happened. So as soon as those fish start filling that net, Peter, all of a sudden it clicks. The guy that is standing there, I can't really see, that's yelling to us on the beach, that is not just some stranger, okay? Jesus showed up. He said he was coming to Galilee. He said he was going to meet us. Jesus is out there. And so he's so overwhelmed in this moment because, again, connecting from his calling and knowing this miracle and knowing that was Jesus, that Peter can't contain himself. So he literally, guys, as you read parts of chapter 21, he jumps out of the boat, uh, such a Peter thing to do, and he swims to the shore, okay? He can't wait for the boats to get there. He's got to do his thing, and he jumps out, and he swims to the shore. And as he starts getting out of the water before everybody else catches up, the Scriptures tell us that Jesus was there waiting. And as he comes out of the water and he's soaking wet and he, he sees Jesus, Jesus is like, hey, you know, I, I've got this fire, I've got some fish, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have breakfast together. And in those few moments, and even as the others start catching up and get the boats get to the shore and they all start getting out as well, um, in the, the, the few one-on-one -on -one moments Jesus had with Peter before um, uh, the others get there and then even after at first, Jesus um, invites um, Peter to, to, to step into some relationship and fellowship. But what he does not do is he does not shame Peter immediately. He does not correct Peter immediately. What the first thing that he does is he invites Peter to have breakfast with him on the beach. And here, friends, I think we're going to see the first crucial step in failing forward when we mess up. Jesus demonstrates it for us here, and that is fellowship. That is being able to realize there is still a relationship before we can deal with a problem. That is stepping in and being connected with Jesus um, when we fail. Jesus does not immediately try to fix the problem. He, just, he assures Peter that we're in fellowship. Come, have, have breakfast with me. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk this thing through. Now, pause the story for just a second. Let me talk to you and me. So often as a pastor, I've seen this in my own life, in my own struggles, and I see this so often in, in, in people that I counsel. When we mess up, when we do that thing, when we said that thing, when we think that thing, when we got involved in whatever it is that we feel like has put this big chasm between us and the Lord, so often our first instinct and our first reaction in that moment is to distance ourselves from God and distance ourselves from others. We break off the fellowship. We separate ourselves either because, one, we're ashamed of what we've done. We don't want anybody else to know about it. We sure, you know, even wrestling with God is, is very difficult. Or two, we feel like, okay, I've got to fix this. I made this mistake, God. I know this is exactly not what you want from me. I will make it better, and then I'm going to come back so that we can, we can reconnect again, so that you will love me again, so that we can have, have relationship again, and I can fix it. And so we disconnect from, from relationships so that we can, I hear this all the time, so I can figure things out. I can kind of evaluate the situation and see where we're at. And so, friends, this is why, this is why the couple that is struggling with their marriage will stop coming to church. This is why the man who is relapsing into an addiction with alcohol will stop showing up and communicating with, with his small group. This is why a Christian who is wrestling with their sexuality or they're wrestling with some other sin will stop reading the scriptures and drawing near to Jesus because they're not really sure what he's going to think or what he's going to do because of the stuff that I've invited into my life that I know is contrary to his desire for me. And so we just kind of cut everything off because it's a defense mechanism. It's something we do to kind of make ourselves feel safe in the midst of our, our chaos. It's a defense mechanism. I'm just going to stop everything for a moment while I can figure things out. But here, friends, the problem is that it never, ever makes things better. It always makes things worse when we cut off fellowship and connection with other people. Because when we do that and we separate ourselves from the Lord and we separate ourselves from people that the Lord has put in our life, what we do is we distance ourselves between the tools and the people that God has strategically put in your life to help you walk through the season of your brokenness. And we separate ourselves from the very lifeboat that Jesus is sending our way, thinking it's going to make things better as I try to figure things out, but it makes it worse. And that's what's interesting to hear, though, is that Jesus didn't even give Peter that option. As soon as he gets out of the water, Jesus doesn't start with, hey, you remember what happened? You remember when you blew it, Peter? Um, you were the worst. You know, that's not how Peter started the conversation. He didn't even start the conversation yet. He said, come, let's, let's, let's have breakfast. I've been waiting for you, Peter. I've got a fire ready. And he establishes this, this fellowship with Peter. He didn't even give him the option to, to not have fellowship. And it's only after, friends, in this story, it's only after they all have full bellies and full hearts because they're now sitting in a circle around the campfire um, early hours of that morning um, with Jesus that Jesus then moves on to step two of failing forward. 
But it was important that step one be laid first. That was fellowship. But then Jesus moves to step two of failing forward, and that is actually facing the problem. Because eventually, right, we have to deal with whatever we've invited in. Eventually, we have to step in and wrestle with the struggle. Listen, Truett may have sat in his room until he was 18 um, if I didn't come in there. But there's a point where he was going to have to address what had happened. But I even see that in my interaction with him because as I walk into the room and I held my son and I told him that I loved him and I dried his tears with my hands and we were able to sit on that bed together and I said, okay, buddy, let's talk through what happened. And guess what? I know you've made a mess here, but dad can fix it. Dad knows how to fix what you don't. Dad can help you move to the next step of facing the problem. And this is where we're going to look really quickly at the actual interaction between Jesus and Peter. This is incredible stuff. Okay, so starting in verse 15, listen to what happens. So they're all sitting around the fire now. Everybody else has gotten ashore. They're having breakfast. And then Peter, Jesus says this. When they had eaten breakfast, this is verse 15, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than, than these and these other guys, he was talking specifically about the others that were sitting around the campfire. Now, talk about awkward, okay? Um, uh, uh, immediately, Jesus does not waste any time. He's established fellowship. He makes sure that they understand there is a relationship, but now we're going to deal with a problem. And he immediately asks him this question, do you love me more than everybody else around the circle, bless Peter? Do you know why Jesus did that? Well, let me help you, under, if you don't remember, on the night that Jesus was arrested in the upper room, uh, and Jesus tells all the disciples, hey, you're all going to abandon me, everybody's going to leave me. Here's what Peter said um, when Jesus said that was going to happen. Um, and this is in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 26. Um, uh, uh, Peter said, listen, even if everyone else falls away, he's in the upper room with the other disciples, even if all these guys fail and, and bail Jesus, um, even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never, ever fall away. And then Jesus says, truly I tell you, he said to him, that tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me. How many times? Three times. So Peter doubles up. No, Jesus, even if I have to die with you, Peter said, I will never deny you. Okay, this is with everybody else in the room. Peter's basically saying, hey, I don't know what they're going to do. Okay, I don't know how they're going to handle this situation, but I love you more than that. And if that's what they're going to do, I love you more than they do. Okay, I am Peter. I am the rock. I am with you all the way. And Jesus intentionally asked him that question to trigger this memory because what Jesus is going to start to do is he gets the problem out in the open is he's going to highlight a reality of a struggle. And that was this, that Peter, you are not as strong as you think you are. I appreciate your resolve, but you are not as strong as you think you are. In fact, in your pride and in your strength, you cut off allegiance to me three different times, Peter. And notice, what, what is he calling here? Back in verse 15, Simon what? Son of John. He doesn't call him Simon what? Peter. Remember, Jesus gave him the name Peter. It meant rock. Okay, and Jesus gave him that name when he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Jesus had said, hey, you're going to be the leader of this thing that I'm going to start called the church after my resurrection, and it's going to be amazing. You're going to change the world, and you're going to be the rock. But he doesn't call him Peter here. Because in the last couple of days, Peter has been exposing his weaknesses and not, not his what? Strengths. So Jesus is very pointedly dealing with this, this problem. So as everybody's sitting around, Jesus says, okay, so do you still hold to what you said that night? Do you love me, Peter, more than, more than these guys? Peter says, yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, okay, well, then feed my lambs. Take care of those that I'm going to trust to you. Do the work that I set about for you. Now, I imagine, okay, hey, how many of you ever, like, growing up, you were, like, at a friend's house when their parents were, like, you know, getting, they were in trouble, right? And their, like, parents are yelling at them, and you're in the room, and you don't know where to look, so you just kind of look down. It's really awkward. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I feel like this is what was happening around that campfire. Okay, so they're all having a great time. They're having breakfast, and all of a sudden, Jesus just calls Peter out, and everybody's like, oh, don't look at Peter. Um, this is really uncomfortable. Uh, where did this come from, Jesus? Uh, and by the way, what are you going to say? Do you love Jesus more than me? Um, uh, you know, kind of th th this awkward moment. And so Peter answers very quickly, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then awkward silence. <laughs> and it's like, oh. And Peter says it again, or Jesus says again, listen. He asked him a second time. Second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you what? Do you love me? And notice this time he drops the qualifier. He doesn't say, do you love me more than everybody else? Just, just between me and you, Peter. Look me in the eyes. I know what you've been feeling. I know what you've been wrestling with. Do you love me? Again, Peter says, yes, Lord. 
you know that I love you. And then Jesus says, okay, Peter, shepherd my sheep. Do what I've called you to do. Now, here's what's really interesting, okay? This is where sometimes the English does not help us understand all the things that were in the Greek that were in the original text, okay? Because the word that Jesus uses when he asks Peter if he loves him, it's from the Greek word um, agapao, which is where we get our word, like agape love, okay? So Jesus is asking, like, in the Greek, this was like the highest kind of love. Like, this was the ultimate love. This is the kind of love that comes from God. This is like love that is wholehearted, all in, supernaturally, uh, you know, uh, uh, equipped from the Lord. And so Jesus is asking him, do you love me this way? But every time Peter has answered, so far, he uses a different verb. He uses this verb, it's phileo, which is a brotherly love. Okay, it's still a love, but it's not like love of the highest kind. So it's kind of like they're having a DTR, you know, define the relationship. I love you. Well, I kind of like you. I like you a lot, you know. Um, kind of one of those, those awkward moments like, okay, I just told you I loved you and you said you liked me. That's, you know, you know uncomfortable and awkward. But Peter, Peter can't say I love you like that. The most he can muster because of his failure and the weight of what he's saying is, Lord, you know that I, I love you. So here's the interesting thing. Jesus asked him the same question a third time, okay? Um, so he asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But right here, if you want to circle, underline, remember this, he changes the word here to phileo. The third time, Jesus doesn't say agape. He drops the bar. Okay, do you like me a lot, Peter? And that's why it says here in verse 17, Peter was grieved. Peter was grieved that he said a third time, do you love me in this lesser? Because in that moment, Peter realized, okay, you know, he knows everything. He knows Jesus is pointing out in front of everybody else in front of me that I am incapable of loving him wholeheartedly and giving myself to him because I blew it. I messed up tremendously. I failed God. I have no standing in front of him now. And so now he has to even, he can't even use the word love when he's asking me. He has to drop to my level because he knows that I cannot muster up and do this. Now, how many times have you felt this way in your approach to God? Lord, I know I had that affair in my past, and I know that it wreaked havoc on my family and my marriage and my life, and the weight of that is on me, and I'm trying to tell you that I love you, but I'm so ashamed, and I know you can't use me anymore, and I know that I'm out, and I know that I'm not worthy anymore. Um, I, I can't get you know, or that, that, that addiction that I have right now that I'm struggling with, it's separating me and you, and you could never love me like I am, and I know I'm a failure. I know before you I can't do these things. And so Peter just says to Jesus, he says, Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. Even with my past, everything that I can give, it may not be the highest and I may have failed, but with everything I can possibly muster in my broken heart itself, I want you to know that I love you. I want to give you everything I can, but I know, I know it's not, I know it's not enough. And here's the interesting thing, I don't think Peter catches what's happening in this conversation. I don't think he's picking up on the feed my sheep part that Jesus keeps saying at the end of each phrase. Do you see what's happening here? John only uses the word charcoal fire two times in his gospels. It's only mentioned two times in the New Testament. One occasion was Peter standing around that fire in the high priest's courtyard the night Jesus was arrested when he denies Jesus how many times? Three times. And then Jesus works out a circumstance where the same way he called Peter to ministry three years earlier with a fish, draws Peter himself. He sits him down around a charcoal fire, and three times he looks for Peter to affirm his love, and his allegiance. And each of those three times when Peter says, yes, with everything that I've got, I know I failed, I know I blew it, but with everything I have, I do love you. Every time, what does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. That was Peter's calling. You're going to be the rock on which I build my church. Jesus right here, friends, he is reinstating Peter. He is reinstating him publicly in front of everybody else. He doesn't say, okay, game over, Peter, you're out. He doesn't say, hey, you're not good enough, hey, you're done. What he does is, is he does. In the moment when they face the problem, um, he brings out the hidden shame. He gets it out in the open. They begin to process through it and talk through it. But then Jesus forgives him as he reinstates him, and then he gives him steps to move forward. Jesus kept saying, okay, you're going to feed my sheep. You're going to do what I called you to do. I know you failed, and I know you feel like that you're worthless, and you can't do it, but I'm calling you to feed my sheep. Listen, I know that facing the problem, Peter, is uncomfortable. Listen, I know, Jeremiah, and the sinful strongholds that you have, it is uncomfortable to get your baggage and your mess out in the open so that God can do it and so he can place other people in our life to help work through it. And I know it's uncomfortable, but it is critical in the process so that you can begin moving forward. You've got to be willing to come forward to the Lord first and foremost and confess, you know, that I blew it, Lord. I do love you, but I know that I, that I messed up and I did these things. 
But then you also need to take advantage of the people that God has strategically placed in your life. Listen, God speaks to us in three primary ways in the New Testament area, okay? We have the Word of God that was given to us. We have the Spirit of God that was given to us. And then he established a church for a reason. The church is not just so we can come and learn stuff. The church is so that you can be surrounded by other believers that he has uniquely gifted to help you walk through your journey. Because he has given each of those believers unique spiritual gifts for the building up of what? The body. And so Jesus does not want us to, to cut off relationship. He wants us to, to, to get these things out in the open, um, whether it's with a small group or with a pastor or with close friends. Not so that he can shame you, so that he can begin the process of helping to heal you and move you forward. Because there's someone right now, friends, that's in your small group. Are there someone in the ministry that you're serving here at Rush Creek? Or there's someone certainly here at Rush Creek Church that God is equipped to help you walk through the struggle that you're in right now. And he wants to use them to minister to you by his spirit. People that he has put into your life. But listen, they can't help you if they do not know. And they're not going to know if, one, you break fellowship and you separate yourself from his church and you separate yourself from relationship. They're not going to know, two, if you're not willing to be honest about where you are and the struggles that you have. Friends, this is why the enemy hates fellowship. This is why he hates that first point, because if he can keep you disconnected and feeling bad about your thing and trying to fix it on your own, he can keep you in the same place, crying in the middle of your mess indefinitely. But once you get connected with other believers and the Holy Spirit begins to work through them as well as work through you in your personal life and prayer and the word and begins to come around you and realize that you can move forward. But community and fellowship builds a safe space where you can have the hard conversations with people to help you fail forward, just like Jesus is doing for Peter in this circle of guys that are also going to walk through the next stage of life with him. As God is going to uniquely help him to move from Peter, the betrayer, to Peter who loves Jesus with an agape love so much so that he would be willing to give his life for him. Because that's the final step is, is follow and failing forward. So listen to what happens as, as this part of the story closes. This is verse 18. So Jesus says, truly, I tell you, after he said, feed my sheep, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But Peter, when you grow old, you're going to stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. And he said this to indicate by which kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he said, follow me. So here we have the prediction of Peter's death. Now, now Peter's death traditionally is under Nero in Rome, crucified upside down is what the tradition was. But um, Jesus right here was saying, hey, when you were younger and immature, you did things your own way, you ran your own way. But as you get older, you're going to let others help you. You're going to let me lead you. And I'm actually going to lead you to a place that you're not even going to feel like you can go, but you're going to do it anyway talking about Peter's impending death. Now, that seems like really awkward encouragement. You know, I'm struggling, and then Jesus tells me I'm going to die. Um, cool. Um, this is awesome. But you've got to understand that for Peter, it was the exact opposite. It was the exact opposite. Because, let's listen, for the past week and a half, he had been struggling nonstop with his moment of weakness of denying Jesus. He had been wrecked by the fact that he was not faithful enough to stand before the Lord as he wanted. He felt lesser than he felt ashamed because he did not stand. And so Jesus right here, what he's doing for Peter, even though it seems like grim news, he's saying, hey, you're going to get your second chance that you so desperately wanted to stand for me. And guess what, Peter? When it happens, you are going to stand firm, friend. And when it happens, you're going to go to your grave for my name because you're going to be so bought in. You are not done, Peter. Peter, your failure is not final. The thing that you desire more than anything to show me your love, you're going to get that chance and you're going to stand. Your past does not determine your future. And for Peter, that was the best news ever. Because now he's been restored to fellowship. Now the problem has been brought out into the open and worked through and dealt with and talked about. And now Jesus said, hey, from this point forward, I don't want you to look back. I want you to look forward. You're going to follow me into the next steps of your journey. You're not going to stay here in the same place and wallow forever in the things that you've done and the mistakes that you've made and the baggage that you brought. I came to give my life so that that was not your story. So that I can move you out. And from this point forward, Peter, there is no guilt, there is no shame, there is glorifying the Lord in that while you were weak, you have been made strong. That while you have failed, you have new life and new hope. Your failure, Peter, is not final if you will fail forward in fellowship with me and my, my church. 
facing the things that you have invited into your life and dealing with them even though it may be painful. And then stepping forward, not letting the enemy tell you you're lesser than or that you can never be used again. Not letting your guilt or your shame determine your future. When you do that, your failures will be turned into something that honors and glorifies God as he redeems you and your life. So here's what I ask as we close today. Some of you feel like you've got a, a busted Ecto-1 right now. Jeremiah, you don't understand the things that I've done, the things that I've said, the people that I've hurt. I don't know if this can be fixed. And, you know, why would God even want to do that? Because of the mess that I've made. So my question for you, friends, is very clearly from the Gospels, from, from Peter's story, we see that it is not his desire for you to stay there. So where's the breakdown for you taking your next step? Is it fellowship? Is it facing the problem? Or is it being willing to step forward in freedom because Jesus has forgiven you and cast your sins as far as the east is from the west? For some of you, it's fellowship. And you've been coming to Rush Creek for a long time, but you've never really gotten plugged in. You've never built any relationships. And you're hoping every week when you come in, you're going to get some more head knowledge to kind of help you work through whatever situation in your brokenness so that you can figure out how to do it. But then you go home and you're isolated and you're still trying to figure it out yourself. But maybe the question you need to start, start asking as you come to this church and you come to worship is not what do I need to know, but maybe it's who do I need to meet? Who do I need to let God bring into my life to use their giftings that the Spirit has given them to help me walk through this so I'm not doing it on my own? So I'm not keeping it in secret. So I'm not trying to just figure things out on my own. I need fellowship. I need a small group. I need community. I need to know people, and I need to be known by people. For some of you, that needs to be the first step. Who are you going to face the problem with if you don't have fellowship with people to walk you through? For others, it may be facing the problem. Maybe you're in a small group right now, but you have not been honest with where you're at and what you're struggling with and things that are behind closed doors that nobody else knows about. Maybe it's time. It's got to be the right person. It's time to get that other believer that you know has your back and say, hey, listen, nobody knows about this, but this is wrecking my life. Please walk through this with me. Maybe you need to get into regen, which is all about getting all the baggage out onto the table and processing through it so that you can draw closer to Jesus. Incredible ministry every Monday night that we meet. You can face the problem. And then there's some of you that have done a great job of both. You've gotten connected. You've got some of it out in the open. You've worked through things. But you still, you still carry around the shame and the baggage that Jesus has already said, I've forgotten it. Why are you carrying it? And you need to ask him to help you release from that so that you can follow forward. And stop looking about, but Jesus, no, did you forget about this? I know I, know, I, know I got it. I, but listen, you did, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Follow. Forward. So right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, here's what I want to do. I just want to ask you, would you pray right now, if this is you, if this is the season that you're in, would you just pray right now and ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment on which step in the process you need to, to, to just put a foot into today? I'm not saying you're going to solve everything in one moment, one message, but how do you step in? Do you need to step into fellowship? Do you need to step into facing the problem? Do you need to step into following forward? We're just asking to give you boldness to do that and be willing to follow through and help you Get out of where you are and get to where he wants you to go. And if he's putting one of those three things on your heart, I want you to just pray, Jesus, would you not only point it out to me, would you give me the strength to be willing to follow up and see what that looks like? If you need to come talk to one of our pastors after the service, we can talk to you about getting connected in fellowship. We can talk to you about facing the problem. We can wrestle with you, or we can pray with you about re being relieved from guilt. But what is it that I need to do? And Lord, would you please provide me the strength to actually step into that moving forward? And right now, I want to pray over you. Lord, would you just please, in this place, in this room, For those that are alone and isolated in the middle of their mess, let them know that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, would not die in the midst of our brokenness, but we would have everlasting life. That there is forgiveness and there is grace and there is mercy and there is a future because of what you have done for us.
I pray you would give them the boldness this week to reach out, whether it's today or during the week, to, to, to take that active next step in their faith journey. We pray all these things in your name.